Next, from the Union League Club of Chicago, historian Michael Burlingame discusses his two-volume biography of Abraham Lincoln. This address was part of a day-long forum marking the 150th anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's first inauguration as president, held on March the 4th, 1861. This runs about 40 minutes. Last year, Michael Burlingame won the Lincoln Prize for his monumental two-volume, 2,000-page, cradle-to-grave biography of Abraham Lincoln. A mutual friend of ours said, it's the only book I ever downloaded that actually made my Kindle heavier. <laughs> As of last night, I'm within 200 pages of the conclusion. I have much larger biceps and a much bigger head. It's absolutely a wonderful book and obviously commend to you. Uh, he is the Chancellor Naomi B. Lynn Distinguished Chair in Lincoln Studies at the University of Illinois in Springfield and a very dear friend. Please welcome Michael Burlingame. Well, thanks for that kind in invitation, Brian. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I had the honor to speak here two years ago, and it is an honor to be in invited to speak at such a prestigious venue as the Union League Club of Chicago. It's especially uh, an honor to be invited back to speak at the Union League Club of Chicago, so uh, I'm very grateful. Uh, now, Brian mentioned uh, my book, and um, <laughs> you all might like to see what it looks like. Uh, it's called Abraham Lincoln, A Life. Be sure to buy it. You don't have to read it, but be sure to buy it. Um, and I spent much of my adult life before uh, uh, taking over the Lynn chair at the University of Illinois at Springfield uh, in New England. And as you may know, sports writers and sportscasters in that region of the country regularly refer to something called the Green Monster. You baseball fans will recognize that as an allusion to the left field wall at Fenway Park where the Red Sox play. But I like to think that when they mention the Green Monster, they're plugging my book. <laughs> now, as Professor Zarevsky said so eloquently in his, his mesmerizing talk, there was likely to be some overlap. In fact, he stole half my thunder. <laughs> so I have a carefully prepared address here, which times out to the exact spot, the amount of time that I was supposed to speak, and uh, I'm going to have to make some adjustments. And I thought uh, one way to do that would be take a little time to tell you how I became a Lincoln scholar in the first place, with apologies to folks who've heard this story. It's partly because I was born and raised in Washington, D.C. This was slightly after the unfortunate event at Ford's Theater. <laughs> I, don't mean, I don't mean to joke about my age. I'm 69, but I prefer to think of it as 20 Celsius. <laughs> Feel free to use that. I stole it from Tom Lehrer. Uh, and so, growing up in Washington, I saw the Lincoln Memorial, the Ford's Theater, the White House, the Capitol, uh, picnics at Manassas. Well, so that, I think, predisposed me to be a Lincoln scholar. Another thing that I think predisposed me to become a Lincoln scholar was the fact that one of my ancestors was Anson Burlingame. He was my great-grandfather's cousin, and he was Lincoln's minister to China. So there's some little connection there. Another reason why I became a Lincoln scholar is because when I was an undergraduate, as a freshman, I had a mesmerizing teacher, David Herbert Donald. Some of you may recognize that name. He was a graduate of the Du Bois at the satellite campus in Champaign-Urbana. And uh, uh, he... Uh, he worked under James G. Randall, the premier Lincoln scholar of two generations ago. And I got to know him very well as a freshman in college. Uh, and he took, me out, he took me under his wing and he made me his research assistant and was extremely influential. He was, as I say, a mesmerizing teacher and uh, a great influence in my life. Uh, if he had been a medievalist, I would probably be writing about the Middle Ages today. Uh, another reason why I became a Lincoln scholar was because of an episode that took place during my senior year in college. I was 
uh, it, was, it was actually the summer between my junior and senior years, I was working at the Library of Congress as a summer employee, and uh, I was working in the manuscript division. And then that job had been obtained for me through the good offices of the chairman of the history department at my university. And he was there working on his magisterial history of European economic development. And he would regularly invite me to join him and his friends for lunch. And it was a treat for a callow youth of 20 Fahrenheit, as, as I then was, uh, to have lunch with distinguished scholars of American history and European history. And one day, about a dozen of us were sitting around the table at the Library of Congress cafeteria, and a fellow started to tell a story about Douglas Southall Freeman. And that name may ring a bell with some of you. He wrote a four-volume biography of Robert E. Lee and a three-volume study of Lee's lieutenants. And at the end of his life, he was writing a multi-volume biography of George Washington. And this fellow said, the funny thing about the author, Freeman, as each of the volumes of the Washington biography appeared, you could detect changes in the author. He began to adopt Washington's gestures and Washington's mannerisms. And he began to talk in 18th century locutions. And he even began to look like George Washington. Well, at that point, I straightened up my bow tie and said, <clears throat> well, when I graduate from college, I'm going on into a PhD program in history, war, and reconstruction, and people have told me that I look like Abraham Lincoln. At which point, he banged his fist on the table, and all the silverware jumped up and came clattering back down to the green formica-clad tabletop. And he announced in a voice that could have been heard in Chicago if the door had been opened at the Library of Congress, holy mackerel, Mike, you're ugly, but you're not that ugly. <laughs> and I think ever since that day, I knew I was fated to be a Lincoln scholar. But, okay, enough levity. Let's get down to business here. Um, the uh, focus of my talk is to emphasize that Lincoln, in drafting and delivering the first inaugural address, was, in fact, conciliatory. Now, it's fashionable in some historical circles these days to claim that Lincoln was insufficiently conciliatory between the time that he was elected in November of 1860 and the time he was inaugurated in March of 1861. And that he should have done more to placate the South, to delay the onset of the Civil War, or even avert it. And he, he uh, therefore failed as a statesman in this period between his election and his inauguration. Now, this is not a, a particularly new uh, theory, but um, in fact it was most articulately put forward about 70 years ago by a distinguished historian named David Potter. But it's also, it, it's re re enjoying something of a revival these days. Last month in Springfield, on February 11th and 12th, which we Springfielders refer to as the High Holy Days, um, uh, two scholars, uh, one a rising young scholar and one a very senior scholar, made the argument that Lincoln was insufficiently conciliatory. And that uh, he should have been more willing to meet the South halfway. Well, I would like to argue that the inaugural address that Lincoln delivered on March 4th, 1861, was in fact, uh, struck a great uh, balance between being sufficiently conciliatory to the South and sufficiently firm to placate and to please the Republican Party, which had honored him with the nomination. And as we have heard Professor Zarevsky uh, so uh, eloquently explain, when Lincoln drafted his first inaugural address, he was a hard liner. Lincoln, like many people in the North, was indignant at the South for having, or the lower South, for having seceded. And in fact, he was indignant at the Buchanan administration for acquiescing in the secession of the seven states of the Lower South. And when he heard a rumor that the Buchanan administration was going to allow the South Carolinians to take over Fort Moultrie, one of the forts around Charleston Harbor, he said, Lincoln said indignantly, if that happens, they ought to hang Buchanan. Well, he, was, he was really quite indignant. And so he was powerless as he sat in Springfield and South Carolina, then Florida, then Alabama, then Georgia, then Mississippi, then Louisiana, then Texas all seceded. 
And Lincoln regarded his great challenge in framing the first inaugural was to keep the upper south, that is the states of Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, Arkansas, Maryland, Delaware, Missouri, uh, all those states, and Kentucky of course, in the Union. And so as he worked on his inaugural address, he started off by taking a hard line. As Professor Zarevsky pointed out, the final sentence of the original draft, shall it be a piece or a sword? Pretty uh, controversial, pretty uh, inflammatory. Instead, he drops that sentence and adds the beautiful final paragraph that Seward had suggested and that's, that Lincoln had transformed from relatively prosaic language into a golden response. So, uh, in framing the inaugural address, uh, Lincoln bent over backwards in terms of both tone and substance to be conciliatory, except on two matters. First, slavery must not be allowed to expand. Second, the doctrine of secession must not be allowed to stand. But short of that, he was willing to make concession after concession after concession. The Fugitive Slave Act would be enforced. He would not attempt to impose, and he explains this not only in the first inaugural, but also in letters to uh, folks in Congress, uh, he would not seek to impose abolition on Washington, D.C., or in federal forts, or in federal facilities elsewhere in the South. He would not appoint abolitionists to serve as postmasters and revenue collectors and other civil servants in the Deep South. There was fear among many Southerners that such a piece could become the nucleus of a Republican Party in the South that would enlist the non-slaveholding whites into a party that would challenge the power that the slaveholding classes enjoyed in the various southern states. So, uh, so he, he tailors that first inaugural to make sure that these uh, concessions and that the tone of his language would keep the Upper South loyal to the Union. And his hope was, as Professor Zarevsky mentioned, that if he could frame a first inaugural that would keep the Upper South in the Union and would also please the Republican Party, because he felt that he could not betray the basic principles of the Republican Party. The, the, the absolute bedrock principle of the Republican Party was there shall be no extension of slavery. And Lincoln believed that if he were to make a concession on that basic principle, that the party would fall apart and that his administration would be a failure before he was even sworn into office. And when you stop to think about it, that makes sense. The Republican Party in 1860 was, like many political parties in this country, a coalition of very disparate elements. For example, the Republican Party contained former Whigs and former Democrats. Lincoln, of course, was a former Whig. Uh, many of his uh, allies in the party were former Democrats. And that they had engaged in bitter factional quarrels, Whigs and Democrats, for decades. And getting former Whigs and former Democrats to cooperate with each other was a little bit like uh, in Connecticut, where I, I lived for many years, getting Yankee fans and Red Sox fans to, to, uh, to cooperate with each other. Uh, in addition, there were free traders in the Republican Party, and there were protectionists. There were German Protestants here in the Midwest, and there were anti-immigrant uh, know-nothings in the East. Uh, there were beer-loving Germans in the Midwest and prohibitionists from New England. There were abolitionists in Massachusetts and slaveholders in Kentucky. How do you keep all of these elements together? The glue that allows these elements to cooperate with one another is the principle that slavery is wrong and shall not be allowed to expand into the territories. So, uh, so th and that turns out to be the one issue that critics of Lincoln, both then and historians today, focus on. Lincoln should have made some concession 
on that territorial issue. And it has been argued that there was one compromise proposal that was floated during the secession crisis that might have actually worked. And that was known as the Crittenden Compromise. It was named after a Kentucky senator named Jay Crittenden. And it, in essence, it was a complicated package, but the, the heart of it was that the line that had bisected, a kind of equator that had bisected the Louisiana Purchase Territory, that enormous hunk of territory that was purchased in 1803 from France and which was divided into a northern zone where slavery was forbidden and a southern zone where slavery was allowed along a line of 36 degrees and 30 minutes. And the Crittenden Compromise called for just taking that line which ran from the Mississippi River out basically to the Rockies and extending it all the way to California. Above that, in the territories that the United States had acquired from Mexico, slavery would be forbidden. Below that line, slavery would be allowed. Lincoln emphatically worked behind the scenes to defeat that proposition. When, as, as Dr. Schwartz pointed out, um, he writes to uh, Kellogg and to other members of the House and the Senate saying, do not cave in on this Crittenden Compromise. Do not make compromises on the principle that slavery shall not be allowed to expand into the West. Now, could Lincoln have reasonably supported that without, in effect, ruining his administration? That seems to me to be an unreasonable expectation. Another criticism that's made about Lincoln in his uh, period between his election and his inauguration is that he didn't try hard enough to put Southerners into his cabinet. Now he did name two men out of the seven men who served in his cabinet from slave states. Montgomery Blair, who was his postmaster general, was from Maryland. And the, uh, and the, and the Blair family, uh, had connections not only with Maryland, but also with Missouri. And from Missouri, he took Edward Bates to be his attorney. Now, these are border states. He did try to get people from below the border states into the upper south states of Virginia, North Carolina, and the like. Um, but they turned him down. So again, Lincoln was being conciliatory. He was trying to get somebody from the south uh, below the border states, and his efforts turned out to be a failure. Now, Professor Zarefsky dealt with the question of whether the first inaugural should be considered a success or a failure. And that some people say, well, he uh, tried to keep the Upper South in, but the Upper South seceded. Well, that's one way to regard the first inaugural as, as a failure. But I would like to suggest that, in fact, the first inaugural was a success. Because what Lincoln was trying to do was to, as I said earlier, to keep the Upper South in the Union. And the response to the first inaugural was basically positive in the Upper South. Members from Tennessee, from Kentucky uh, in Congress said, you know, we can live with this. Um, uh, one of the things that the uh, senator from Tennessee, Andrew Johnson, said is, look, I can go back to Tennessee and I can get people to defeat the secession movement because Lincoln's first inaugural is conciliatory and it contains support for the 13th Amendment. That was the amendment <clears throat> that was, it was pointed out, guaranteed slavery in the states where it already existed. Now, it may seem ironic that Lincoln would support an amendment that would guarantee slavery since he was the great emancipator, but Lincoln, in fact, regarded the 13th Amendment as it was proposed on the eve of his inaugural address as a tautology, that it was already in the Constitution, that the Constitution prohibited any federal tampering with slavery in the states where it already existed. And the adoption of the 13th Amendment, which passed the Senate in the wee small hours just before Lincoln's inaugural address, it was about four in the morning and Lincoln gives his talk at noon, the passage of that amendment through the Senate by a bare two-thirds majority seems to have been Lincoln's handiwork. That it was looked as though it was going to stall in the Senate. Lincoln meets, the evidence for this is, is not conclusive, but it's suggestive, meets with senators who will heed his advice 
and they vote in sufficient numbers to get that amendment through. So here's Lincoln, he's making the concession of, of the 13th Amendment. He's making the concession of trying to get Southerners into the cabinet. He's making the concessions that he makes within the uh, inaugural address, and it seems to have worked. That is, the Upper South seems to have regarded it, on the whole, as peaceful. And so, in that sense, it should be considered a success. However, and I, I imagine Lincoln on, on the eve of March 4th, going home to the White House, spending his first night in the White House, and relaxing and saying, wow, we dodged a bullet. I've been, able to, I've been able to get inaugurated. I've been able to deliver an address, which I think will please the Republican Party, seems to do that, and will please the Upper South, seems to do that. And now we can let time work its healing wonders. The Upper South will stay in the Union. The Lower South, which consists of just seven slave states, will eventually, in the course of time, come to realize that they are too small to form an independent republic and that they will voluntarily rejoin the Union. And so as Lincoln relaxes and takes that uh, consolation, uh, he then wakes up the next day and is handed a letter saying, Fort Sumter is running out of food. And within six weeks, it will have to surrender unless you decide to resupply it. And so the first inaugural then <laughs> turns out to be uh, undermined, the effect of the, uh, first, uh, the, uh, the first inaugural is undermined by this word from, South, uh, from Charleston, from uh, Fort Sumter. And so Lincoln then has, in the next six weeks, the same challenge. How do I conciliate my parties, my, my Republican Party colleagues, and how do I keep the upper South in the Union? And once again, Lincoln is a conciliatory leader. He tries everything he can think of to keep this Sumter crisis from provoking war. He even goes so far at one point as the Fort Sumter crisis grew ever more dangerous. He even goes so far as to suggest to members of the Virginia State Secession Convention meeting in Richmond, he calls one of those leading unionist delegates to the White House uh, and says, if you will adjourn your secession convention and guarantee that Virginia will stay loyal to the Union and thereby keep the rest of the Upper South states in the Union, because Virginia was the most important of the Upper South states, North Carolina looked to it, Tennessee looked to it, Arkansas looked to it as the leader of their, that region. If we could keep Virginia in the Union, the secession threat will eventually wither. The Lower South will realize it won't get the Upper South support, and it will, in fact, voluntarily rejoin the Union. Now, Lincoln has been critical. It didn't work out. That is, the, the Virginia delegation didn't follow up on it. Now, Lincoln has been criticized for grossly overestimating the degree of Unionist sentiment in the South, this notion that the South would voluntarily come back into the Union. And was Lincoln being hopelessly naive? Well, I don't think so. Because what Lincoln looked at to determine whether secession sentiment was widespread in the South, or whether it was really representative of only a, a hot-headed faction, when Lincoln tried to assess the degree of the South, there were no public opinion polls, uh, no exit polls to go on. And so Lincoln turned to the one source of information that seemed to be reliable, that was the votes that were cast in the 1860 election. And in the South, voters had three options. They didn't vote for Lincoln, but they could vote for a Northern Democrat, Stephen A. Douglas. They could vote for a Southern Democrat, John C. Breckinridge. Or they could vote for a member of what was called the Constitutional Union Party, uh, which stood for uh, uh, obedience to the Constitution and uh, enforcement of the laws. So Lincoln reasonably concluded that if you took all of the votes for the Constitutional Union candidate, John Bell, and all the votes for the Northern Democratic candidate, Stephen A. Douglas, and added them together, and then you compared that vote to the Breckinridge vote, 
which was, in Lincoln's estimation and the estimation of most people at that time, the vote of the secessions, the pro-secession uh, faction, that in fact in the South there were more pro-union votes, if you interpret the Douglas votes and the Bell votes as pro-union, than there were pro-secession votes. So it was not entirely unreasonable on Lincoln's part. Um, so <clears throat> the kind of conciliatory gestures Lincoln makes with regard to the Fort Sumter crisis, I think are consonant with the kind of conciliatory gestures he was willing to make during the period between his election and his inauguration, and that as you examine the evolution of Lincoln's first inaugural address from the very hardline initial draft to the much more conciliatory final draft, I think a reasonable historian has to conclude that in fact Lincoln was being conciliatory and that his statesmanship should not be questioned. I thank you for your attention. Now I'd be happy to answer any questions or respond to any comments. Here we are. Did uh, Lincoln assume that Sumner was going to knock the whole other things and the conciliatory before it actually happened? Did he have an inclination? Did Lincoln think that by sending supplies to Fort Sumter that would necessarily provoke war? Is that a fair summary? Um, I think he had reason to believe that that would be the case because in January of 1861, the Buchanan administration had sent a ship to resupply Fort Sumter called the Star of the West. Uh, it had been fired on by the South Carolina forces, so uh, that was a pretty strong indication that any attempt to resupply would lead to a, uh, an attack. And in addition, he had sent one of his friends um, who had grown up in South Carolina down to investigate the scene and Lincoln did this a lot. He used troubleshooters to go out in his uh, public opinion and report back to him. Uh, and so this, this friend of his had gone down, talked to a lot of people in South Carolina and said, there's no way that you're going to be able to resupply Fort Sumter without provoking a fight. Now, some historians have argued that Lincoln, uh, in a Machiavellian, clever, cynical fashion, deliberately inveigled the South into firing the first shot and which was a public relations disaster for the South, but it was really Lincoln's doing that made it uh, look that way, that he, he provoked the South into firing the first shot in a clever fashion. I don't think that's the case. I think Lincoln realized that that was a possibility, but it wasn't a certainty. And if there was to be a first shot, if there was to be a war, he preferred that it actually be the South that fired it. And in fact, uh, when... Uh, Orville Browning told Lincoln that he should, he should tone down his first inaugural address. Don't talk about repossessing the forts. That, that, that will be interpreted as an aggressive act, and the blame for starting the war, if there is one, will fall on the North and your administration. It's much better if the first shot comes from them, that the perception is that the outbreak of hostilities is the fault of the South. and so. Uh, and I think Lincoln had, very, had that much, very much in mind when, uh, when he made the fateful decision to provision Fort Sumter. But an another thing that should be pointed out, Fort Sumter is in the, in the heart of secessionist territory. The most rabid secessionists are in South Carolina, in Charleston. Lincoln wanted to resupply the fort to uphold the principle that the doctrine of secession was illegal, that there was still one country. And to reinforce or resupply a fort would be a way to assert that. Now, there were two major forts that were still in Union hands. As Professor Zarevsky pointed out, one was in Charleston, the other was just off Pensacola. So what Lincoln hoped to do was to reinforce the fort in Pensacola, Fort Pickens. And so on March 12th, he orders Fort Pickens to be reinforced as a, as a symbol of the authority, the assertion of the authority of the federal government. A, a, a f ships go down with troops to Pensacola, and they're about to enter Fort Pickens when the naval lieutenant in charge there refuses to allow the soldiers to enter Fort Pickens. 
He says, we have made an informal agreement with the Florida authorities not to accept reinforcements, and they agreed not to attack us. And so Lincoln's plan was thwarted by a naval lieutenant. It's just, it's just, and so when Lincoln finally gets the word that the Fort Pickens enterprise has failed, then and only then does he take the final step of notifying the governor of South Carolina that ships are on the way uh, and therefore uh, provoked the, the attack on Fort Sumter. So again, he was being as conciliatory as he could be. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Lynn. Uh, wasn't Lincoln kind of, um, was it Alexander Stevens in correspondence to Lincoln that the uh, secession crisis wasn't a big deal? Oh, yes. Big deal? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the, and and the, the secession crisis in the Deep South was, was particularly in Georgia, uh, very serious indeed. Question? Oh, question? Yes? Go ahead. Oh, Frank Russell, um, I have to ask my, my favorite counterfactual question is, uh, what if Lincoln had lived? Um, the question about what if Lincoln, uh, what would happen if Lincoln lived is highly controversial. When I was in secondary school, it's back toward the tag end of the Second Punic War, uh, <laughs> uh, the standard interpretation of that question was, um, was this, that Abraham Lincoln favored a merciful and generous set of peace terms for the South, that he had spelled those out in December of 1863 in a special message to Congress in which he proposed a, what became known as the 10% plan, whereby the southern states could come back into the Union, have full representation in Congress, participate in presidential elections, have their own governors and legislatures if a population uh, equivalent to 10% of the voting population of 1860 would take an oath of loyalty to the Union. Uh, there would be no, uh, there would be certain high-ranking Confederates would be exempt, but almost everybody else uh, would be allowed, would be granted amnesty and pardon. There was no insistence that there be black voting rights, black citizenship rights, or the like. But you could come back into the Union if you got 10% of your population to take future loyalty and to agree that slavery was dead. Now, the, the uh, interpretation that I was taught as a youngster was Lincoln proposed this modest, generous set of peace terms, and then he gets killed, and Andrew Johnson, his vice president, simply tries to carry out the plan that Abraham Lincoln had spelled out in his 10% proposal back in December 63. And that he got crucified by the radicals in Congress. And the same thing would have happened to Lincoln. That it was good for Lincoln's reputation that he got killed when he did. Well, most historians, and myself among them, don't believe that at all today. And one of the, the most important pieces of evidence to suggest that that interpretation is wrong-headed is that on April 11th, 1865, two days after Robert E. Lee surrendered, Abraham Lincoln gave his last public speech, which of course he didn't know was going to be his last public speech. And the public expected uh, uh, an exercise in national self-congratulation. We've won the war, let's hear it for the Army and the Navy. Lincoln gives a very sober, detailed analysis of Reconstruction, focusing on Louisiana, which would be a kind of template, a model for the other ten Confederate states. And in Louisiana, there had been a Reconstruction uh, process underway. It had, uh, a governor had been elected, a legislature had been elected, a constitutional convention had been held, um, and uh, Congress was impeding the seating of the senators and congressmen from Louisiana, Lincoln was trying to get them to recognize that government as a legitimate government. And so he spells this out in his last final address. And in the course of that address, he says, now there are some people who object to the fact that in Louisiana, the Constitution does not permit blacks to vote. But I believe that some blacks in Louisiana, and by extension elsewhere, should be allowed to vote particularly those who have served gallantly in our ranks and those who are very intelligent. And 
we, we think he meant by very intelligent literate, because there was a fairly large literate black community in New Orleans. And so he's, he's shifting dramatically away from the December 1863 Reconstruction Plan to a plan now that would be more acceptable to the radicals in Congress, which would include black voting. And Andrew Johnson had no desire to see black vote. Black, black vote. Andrew Johnson was a, an East Tennessee, died in the wool racist. And Lincoln, and this, this is something that, that has been known for a long time, but I think the significance of this historical fact has been underappreciated. When Lincoln publicly called for black voting rights in that speech on April 11, 1865, a member of the audience heard it and was incensed. And he turned to his friends and said, that means nigger citizenship. That's the last speech he's ever going to give. By God, I'm going to run him through. And that's John Wilkes Booth. And Lincoln was therefore murdered, not because he issued the Emancipation Proclamation, not because he supported the 13th Amendment, emancipating slaves throughout the nation, not just in the Confederate States. Abraham Lincoln was murdered because he called for black voting rights. And I think it's therefore appropriate for us in the year 2000 and, uh, 2011 to think of Abraham Lincoln as a martyr to black citizenship rights, voting rights, as much as Martin Luther King or Medgar Evers or any of the other folks who were killed in the 1960s as they championed the Civil Rights Revolution. And one of the people who was there on April 11th, in addition to John Wilkes Booth, who heard the speech, was Frederick Douglass, the great black uh, leader. And Frederick Douglass said in a speech later that year, he said, when I and my friends heard Lincoln talk about black voting rights on that memorable April 11th, 1865 day. We were disappointed because of the limited scope of that proposal. Just voting rights for soldiers and sailors and the very intelligent. But we should have recognized that Abraham Lincoln learned his statesmanship in the school of rail splitting. And to split a rail, you take a wedge and you insert the thin edge of the wedge into the log. And having done that, you then take a maul, a big hammer, and you drive home the thick edge of the wedge. And what we should have recognized that day, April 11, 1865, is that Abraham Lincoln was inserting the thin edge of the wedge. And if he had lived, you could count on him, based on what we knew of his earlier history, to drive home the thick edge of the wedge. And that it, this was a speech in December of 65. And if Abraham Lincoln were alive, we would be much better off, black citizenship rights would be much further advanced than they are under Andrew Johnson. And Frederick Douglass in this speech goes on to say that uh, Abraham Lincoln should be considered emphatically the black man's president. And this, this remarkable speech uh, I discovered in the Frederick Douglass papers in his own handwriting. It was not included in the massive five-volume edition of Frederick Douglass's speeches that the Yale University Press brought out a few years ago. And I wrote to the people at Yale and asked them, why didn't you include this remarkable speech in your five-volume edition of Frederick Douglass's orations? And I got no response. So I called them and left a voice message saying, how is it that you omitted this speech? Got no response. Well, those of us who went to Princeton aren't surprised that Yale would conduct itself <laughs> in this fashion, but you know, what, what, what can I tell you? So. <laughs> Another question. Yes. Yes, my question is of a more trivial nature. My name is David Zucker, and I'm from Chicago. And my question concerns, uh, you mentioned something of your own ancestry earlier. I know that you're from California. Uh, does the does Berlin game California somehow have some connection with you and your family? Burlingame, California, as some of you may know, it's, it's in the Bay Area. And actually, when you fly to California, you, you land right next to Burlingame. Um, and it was named after my great-grandfather's cousin, Anson Burlingame, um, because Lincoln had appointed him, as I mentioned earlier, as, as minister, we'd call it ambassador today, minister to China. And he served uh, for several years in what was known, known as Peking, uh, not to be confused with Pekin. Um, <laughs> and uh, he... Uh, he then told the Chinese authorities that he was homesick, he wanted to get back to Boston where he had been an anti-slavery congressman. And, and uh, so the Chinese said, well, uh, look, how would you like to be our freelance 
ambassador to the West to negotiate trade agreements and immigration agreements. And so he said, sure. So he comes back to the United States as a Chinese diplomat. I'm not, I'm not making this up. And, and so he negotiates the famous Berlingame Treaty of 1868. That'll be on the quiz. Mm -hmm. um, and that treaty allowed increased Chinese immigration and trade and imports. I'm going to apply to, to Walmart for a grant based on this, this data. <laughs> um, and uh, so, uh, so uh, as a result, the merchants of San Francisco were uh, delighted that because they had more goods coming through and they, they, they prospered as a result of this. And so they decided to name a town after him. Um, and I was just reading the autobiography of Mark Twain, which I, I commend to your attention, the one that was just, just recently released. And he has qu qu quite a lovely chapter there on what a good guy Anson Burlingame was. Uh, when, when Burlingame was going out to China, he, he was in Hawaii briefly, and then Mark Twain happened to be in Hawaii then on assignment from the Sacramento Daily Union doing stories about life in Hawaii. Um, and anyway, so Anson Burlingame then goes from the United States, where he negotiated this treaty, to England, where he negotiates a similar treaty, to France, where he does a similar uh, service, and then he goes to Russia, and then he dies under very mysterious circumstances in the town of St. Petersburg. And I'm going to prove in a scholarly article someday that that's the ultimate origin of the Sino-Soviet split, that the Russians never forgave the Chinese for killing, I mean, the Chinese never forgave the Russians for killing Uncle Anson. <laughs> okay, well done. Thank you once again. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel to gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois.